talking a few weeks ago about the word trust. In fact, look at your neighbor and say the word trust. trust. All right, good. Maybe a little bit louder. Trust. trust. All right, now say it in Spanish. Confianza. Confianza. There you go. We're talking about trust. So two weeks ago we said, how do I trust God when my life has changes, right? We all go through change. In fact, we even said change is inevitable. We'll all face change, good change or, or not so good change. We'll all encounter change. And how do you trust God in, in the middle of change? Then last week, we kind of went a layer deeper, and we said, how do you trust God when you're facing difficulty? Have you ever found yourself in a difficult situation, kind of you know, between a rock and a hard place? How do you trust God when it's hard? How do you trust God in difficulty? Well, today, we're going to go one more layer deeper, and we're going to walk through how do you trust God when you don't feel like it? Feelings. Feelings. When your feelings aren't there. How do you trust God when the feelings aren't there? Right? Maybe there's other feelings that are battling in your mind. Maybe the feelings of confusion. Maybe the feelings of loneliness. Maybe the feelings of anxiety. Maybe the feelings of stress. Maybe the feelings of worry. And trusting God is just the feeling isn't there. How do you trust God when your feelings aren't cooperating with you? And I believe God's word has a lot to say to us. Now, if you're new to faith in Christ, if you've recently given your life to Jesus, this is something you're going to be spending probably a lot of your time, in fact, thousands of times in your walk of faith, walking through this battle of fear and faith, feelings and faith. If you've been walking with Jesus for any length of time, you understand what we're talking about. There's this battle that continually comes up, faith and feelings, Faith and feelings. How do I choose to live a life of faithfulness or how do I choose to even put trust in God when my feelings aren't there? And that's what I want to take some time to talk about today. And in fact, I think there's four scriptural thoughts that will help us know how to navigate this trust in God when we just don't really feel like it. So if you're writing down some thoughts today, write this down in your notes. Write this down. First of all, we have to recognize that trust is not an emotion. Trust is not an emotion. Trust is an action. It's a verb. Trust is so much more than an emotion. Trust is an action. Jesus talked to his first followers about this the night before he died. He, he knew that he was going to be arrested. He knew that he was going to be tried. He knew that he was going to be crucified on a cross. He knew that he was about to die. He knew that his death would probably bring some fear and worry to the disciples. So he tried to kind of be preventative in helping them understand what we're talking about right now, that trust is more than a feeling, and it's so much more than an emotion. Jesus says in John chapter 14, he says, let not your hearts be troubled, right? That's the feeling, let not your hearts be troubled. Here's the action. Believe in God. Believe also in me. That's the trusting part. Trust is so much more than just what I feel in the moment. He talks about the difference between trusting and feeling, between action and emotion. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Jesus said, you're going to feel this way. It's normal. But your feelings often lie to you. Choose to trust, choose to trust, choose to trust. So, so trust God by remembering that trust is not an emotion, trust is an action. Second thought is remember God's love for you. Remember how much God loves you. Realize that it doesn't matter what circumstances you find yourself in right now, it doesn't matter what your feelings are feeling right now, God loves you. I, I love these verses from the book of Ephesians. Paul writes and he says, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith that you being rooted and grounded in love. Can you say in love with me? In love may have the strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth. Don't miss that of God's love. Whatever you're going through, whatever you might be feeling right now, you might feel far from God. You might feel like God hasn't really answered or heard your prayers. Maybe you even feel like, does God even see you? Does God even know you? I'm just telling you today, nothing can separate you from God's love. 
He won't force his love on you. But the truth is he loves you even now. God loves you no matter what. It's a no matter what kind of love. God loves you. I, I, I know some people just kind of from being a pastor and counseling and praying and walking life with people. I, I know quite a few people that feel ashamed of where they're at in life. Feel unworthy of God's love. So they say things like, well, I need to get myself cleaned up. When I get my act together, then I'm going to go to church. When, when, when I kind of start making right decisions, when I break these bad addictions and change in my life, then I'm going to, they feel like they have to get cleaned up in order to be worthy of God's love. I'm telling you, God loves you in your mess. God already loves you. God loves you. He loves you. He loves you. In fact, God first loved you when you didn't even do anything to merit his love. God already loves you. God's not out to blame you. He's out to love you. That's his heart. That's his, his desire for you. Recognize what, whatever you're going through in life and whatever your circumstances are, and sometimes, man, those circumstances, man, they're scary. They're right there. It's all we can see. It's all that's bouncing around in our mind. I just want to add one more thought that's bouncing around inside of your mind, and it's how much God loves you. He loves you. Maybe write that even down in your notes right now. God loves me. I'm enough. God loves me. God loves me. I, let me, I wanted to try and illustrate it this way. Uh, uh, about a week ago, we, we had a dove that came flying in to kind of the front little porch area of our house. And, and, and if you've seen my house, kind of in the little brick enclave that's there, there there's three little openings in, in the brick right on our front porch. And, and the builder, rather than leaving these three brick openings open, uh, he put like window panes in there. So I got outdoor window panes uh, in our little brick enclave there, front porch. And, and so a dove came flying in. And then went up and then sat on one of the brick ledges and tried to make its way out. It came in this way, but now there's a window pane there and he sees the big, great outdoors. And he just starts banging his head against the window panes trying to get out. I mean, it was just, it sounded like somebody was like having a fight on our front porch. And, and I, I, I opened up the door and I see this dove just banging into the window pane, trying to make its way out because it's wide open, except for the window pane. And I thought, what a crazy bird. <laughs> It'll figure it out. It was there for three days. I'm telling you, the dove was there for three days running into that window pane, trying to make its way out when you had the whole front porch. It could go anywhere it wanted, but it was on that brick ledge running into the window pane. So after three days of this obnoxious noise of this bird just running into the window pane, I thought, I'm going to help the bird. And so I went and I got a broom. Right? So I came out. And I didn't whack the bird. But I got a broom, and I was going to help the bird shush his way out. I don't know if that's even a word, shush. We just made it a word, right? I was going to kind of help that bird get off the little brick ledge and maybe down and out one of the openings in the patio. So I'm sitting here trying to help the bird. The bird was afraid of the broom. Can you believe that? The bird didn't like the thought that, I was trying to help it after three days of running its head into the window pane, thinking that was the way out. And then all of a sudden it hit me. What a parable for life. How many times do we think that we're supposed to be going a certain direction? And we just keep running our head into the window pane over and over and over and over and over again. Yet God in his love... Tries to redirect us. And sometimes we don't like the redirection. Sometimes we don't like the broom. Sometimes we don't like what God's trying to do because we think that's the way we're supposed to go. But God, because he loves us, sees farther down the road than we can see. Yet God, because he loves us, sees a bigger picture than what we can see. Yet God, because he loves us, is going to try and help us go the white way that he wants us to go. God in his love. And you might feel right now that you're in one of these little broom redirect moments of your life right now. 
Maybe, maybe it's you're going through something you didn't expect. Maybe you're going through something you didn't really want. Maybe you're going through something that's really, really, really hard. Maybe you're going through something that's even painful. And maybe God in his love is saving you from something that you don't even know what's out there. Because he loves us, we can trust him. Because he loves us, we can trust his redirection of our lives. Because he loves us. So when I don't feel like trusting God, I have to remember God loves me. God loves me. Here, here's a third thought. When I don't feel like trusting God, here's what I do. I set my mind on things that last. I set my mind on things that last. But if you ever find yourself in one of those moments where life is just overwhelming and everything is just coming at you, and it's one step forward and about three steps back, it's just kind of that time. It's so easy to let our mind become consumed with worry, anxiety, fear, stress, right? It's so easy to be consumed with disappointments and discouragements, yet God's word doesn't tell us, think on discouraging thoughts. Think of all the worry and all the fear, right? We're to set our minds on things that will last. What lasts? Well, God's love lasts. The eternity of heaven lasts. The character that God's building inside of you, the plan that he has that stretches into eternity. Paul writes it this way in Colossians chapter 3. He says, if then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Listen, watch this. Underline this in your Bible. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. Set your mind on what really, really matters. See, it's so easy to be so consumed with the circumstances of our present reality that it's all that we can see. It's all that's right in front of us. It, it, it's all that's running through our mind. Yet Paul's saying, yeah, that's a reality. Life's really hard. And I get that that's where you want to be. So take the action and go beyond that and set your eyes on things that really matter. Why? Because sometimes our feelings don't tell us the truth. You might feel like everybody in the office is talking about you. The reality is they haven't talked about you in weeks. You might feel like that person intentionally, maliciously cut you off in the highway, and you're going to go let them know you didn't appreciate it. The reality is they didn't even know you were there. They were on their phone, oblivious to you. Right? Our feelings lie to us. Our feelings don't always tell us all the truth. What you're feeling doesn't match reality. This happens all the time. So in order to trust when you don't feel like it, you focus on what's real. You focus on what's going to really last for eternity. You focus on the character that God is developing inside of you. You focus on the plan that God is walking out before you. What is God really doing? So you have to ask yourself, am I trusting what is real or am I trusting my feelings in the moment? And then here's the final thing that you do. When you don't feel like trusting God. Maybe that's where you're even at today. You have to remember and know that you're not alone. You're not alone. Don't face your circumstances alone. See, none of us were meant to face it alone. How many times, maybe in our individualism, do we try to like just be enough, be strong enough, be smart enough, be good enough, be enough. And we're never enough, and we end up falling flat on our face time after time after time. And it's not that there's something wrong with you. It's the direction you're going. You were never meant to go through life relying solely on yourself. You were never meant to go through life solely relying on yourself. You were meant to go through life relying on God and surrounded by a company of believers. 
So of course we fall flat on our face when we try to do it by ourselves. The writer of Ecclesiastes describes it this way. And though a man may, might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. Right? One-on-one -on -one combat, 50-50 chance. Two-on-one, -on -one, pretty good odds that the two is going to win. And he goes, but a three-fold cord is not quickly broken. You look at that and, and you say, well, if two-on-one -on -one is good, then of course three-on-one is, is even better. So I wanted to give you an illustration to, to maybe help you understand this idea of a, a three-strand cord. So I got, a, I, I got a little piece of thread here. You probably can't see it, but it comes off of this, this roll of thread. So now you know that I'm telling you the truth because you probably can't see this. But uh, by the way, when, when I was in high school in, uh, in, in Chile and Danny, you were there. I took home ec. <laughs> I took home ec in high school. Not, we didn't have a lot of options, uh, but I, I did it. And so uh, I know how to sew a button back on a shirt. I'm pretty proud of that. Yeah. Renee doesn't. <laughs> just, just saying. <laughs> Although she's not here right now to defend herself. <laughs> I talk big when she's not here. Um, Y'all don't tell her I said that. So I got this little th thread here. And I brought this 10-pound weight from home. That's about all that I can lift right now. And um, so we're going to see if this little thread can hold up to the pressure of life that this 10-pound dumbbell has. Sound good? All right, let's see if we can do this here. Oh, that one, yeah. Wow, don't let that fall on your toe. All right, so if I go to get this around here. All right. Y'all ready for this? It already snapped. There was going to be a cool little pop. So we can all say pop on three. Ready? One, two, three. See, there you go. This little thread didn't hold up to the weight of that 10-pound dumbbell. But what if I took three of those threads and braided them together? So last night I, I cut three threads and and I got to be honest with you, I don't know how to braid. So Renee braided this. And um, so this is three of the same piece of thread that's here that could not hold up that 10-pound dumbbell. But we braided three of them together. And we're just going to see, can a cord of three strands, this little thread that's strong enough to hold a button onto your shirt under most circumstances, can it hold up this weight of a 10 pound dumbbell. So let's try this. You guys ready? Drum roll. <laughs> so yeah, good job, Renee. Her braid <laughs> held up a whole lot better than my sewn on button did. This is what the writer of Ecclesiastes is trying to help us understand. Because how many times in our individualism do we try to do things by ourselves and we fail? And then we think there's something wrong with us. And then we feel like a failure. And then the enemy wants to come and whisper in our ears, you're never enough. You're not good enough. You'll never be victorious over that secret sin. You're never going to be able to restore your marriage. You're always a failure. It doesn't matter what new type of entrepreneur business you're going to start. It's going to continually fail. The enemy wants to come and continually whisper in our ears that you are not enough. And what the writer of Ecclesiastes is trying to say to us is, you know what? When you begin to join your faith with somebody else's faith and with what God is doing, then all of a sudden, you're a whole lot stronger than you think you are. If God is for you, who couldn't be against you? 
Why do we spend time at church praying and praying for one another and ministering in the altar? Because all of a sudden, when we're able to come alongside and, and join my faith with somebody else's faith and, and join my faith and somebody else's faith that's joining with me in the altar and, and with what God is doing, then all of a sudden, we're a whole lot stronger together than any of us are by ourselves. When I don't feel like it, trust me, when I, when I don't feel like it, I just know me. And that's usually where I want to recluse and lick my wounds. And maybe you're a little bit like me. But when I don't feel like trusting God and when things are going bad in my life, I, I, I'm not going to be the happy person at the party. I, I tend to be the person who's going to try and hide and be all alone. Yet that's the unhealthy thing to do. Because all of a sudden, we start to live life in community with one another. That's why we talk about life groups here at Life Church. It's why we believe there's strength in community when I can join my faith with somebody else's faith and with what God is doing and God's word. And all of a sudden, I become a whole lot stronger than I even thought I was. Why? Because we were never designed to do it on our own. We were designed to rely on God and to live life in community with people. So when you don't feel like it, you got to remember you're not alone. Set your minds on things that will last. Remember God's love for you. And recognize that trust is not an emotion. What do you do when you don't feel like it? This is how we're going we're gonna to wrap up today. How do you trust when you don't feel like it? How do you trust when you're just too tired? How do you trust when you're worn out? How do you trust when you're confused? How do you trust when you're stressed? How do you trust when you don't know which way is up and which way is down? Jesus, understanding the emotions and all the things that run through our mind, Jesus says in Matthew chapter 11, come to me. That's his invitation. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus says when you feel worn out, when you feel like you just don't have it in you, when you feel all alone, when you want to go and hide and lick your wounds, when, when you're so confused you don't know which way is up and which way is down, when you're so stressed that you can't make good decisions, when you're hurting so deeply that you can't even vocalize words that anguish is so deep. He said, come to me. Come to me. Come to me. As we get ready to close today, that's what I want to give you an invitation to do. To come to Jesus. And he will give you rest. Let me invite you to bow your head and close your eyes with me for just a moment. <clears throat>